a little judgment that came out earlier today. I guess everybody knows about just maybe it's just the soon that we stop talking about the subject of tonight and talk about the judgment. But I'd be happy to say a few words about it a little later uh, in the evening and the significance of it. The first uh, judgment by the International Criminal Court, and we'll have more, of course, on that. I guess there'll be conferences and seminars just about the, the judgment. Um, so, judicial activism. I, I, was, I was hoping that there might be a little bit of judicial activism in today's judgment. I don't think there, there really is. I think it's actually a rather straightforward, you know, an easy case, really. It always was an easy case, the Lubanga case. I mean, it was straightforward. It was one charge for recruiting child soldiers. And uh, it seems like the judgment, although it's 600 and something pages long, is, is fairly predictable judgment that ultimately they, they chew up the prosecutor, slap him on the wrist and tell him that he was a bad boy and the way he presented the evidence. But nevertheless, finders still have to throw out a lot of the evidence if there's enough evidence to convict them and then conclude that uh, Lubanga was guilty. And there'll be new phases because they have to have the sentencing hearing. I mean, everything is very slow at the FCC. So I think here in the courts, there are people who practice law here and would know better than I would, but I would think that if something was sort of remanded for a sentencing hearing, it might be a matter of a few weeks to maybe a month, but everyone knows, I don't think anyone believes that the ICC could work, ever work that fast. So this will probably be a long time before you sentence, and then we'll have the reparations phase, which everybody's anxious for, which will be nice and complicated, um, and it will all be about non-existent money, because I, as I understand it, the bank doesn't have any money, but that won't stop the judges from doing the detailed examination of the reparations, and then there'll be the appeal. So we haven't heard the end of the bank, I think. I was going to uh, uh, base my remarks on a couple of examples of judicial activism in the field of what we'll call, broadly speaking, international humanitarian law. Uh, this is the first of the seminars I've been at, but I wasn't given a definition of international humanitarian law, but of course it depends upon uh, who's speaking, uh, exactly what's covered by international humanitarian law. I think that. Uh, some people think that it's really just the law of armed conflict. I think if Charles was here, he would he would he would consider international humanitarian law to be essentially the law of armed conflict. But uh, the statutes of the international criminal tribunals, which talk about a jurisdiction based on serious violations of international humanitarian law, uh, have uh, given jurisdiction, and it's been the, really the core jurisdiction of the main international criminal tribunals over genocide and crimes against humanity, as well as war crimes. So um, I'm, I'm taking a broader approach to it, and I'm really going to talk about the tribunals, because it's, it's hard to separate them out anyway, and to just look at the law of armed conflict part of the jurisdiction of the Yugoslavia or the Rwanda tribunal, or the Special Court for Sierra Leone. So my first example is actually not from an international criminal tribunal at all, but it's from a national tribunal or tribunal and that's the uh, Eichmann uh, case. Uh, and it's interesting that we're now in the 50th anniversary of the Eichmann trial. There were two phases to the trial. There was the trial phase, which went on before three judges, and then the appeal. So there are two judgments in the Eichmann uh, case. And a number of interesting legal issues were, were considered by the, the judges in the Eichmann case. And you know, when I first got interested in international criminal law, it was about all we had. Uh, today, you can study international criminal law, and you couldn't even have the ambition to read every judgment. It, there's just too much out there. And even reading the major judgments, I think, would take a student uh, a year or two just to, just to read through them and absorb them. But that, of course, wasn't always the case. And uh, 20 years ago, when you looked at international criminal law, you had the uh, the Nuremberg judgment, <laughs> Tokyo judgment, and some of the control council law judgments of the American military tribunals at the end of the Second World War. And then you had nothing for about 15 years. And then you had Eichmann. And then you had nothing for about another 20 or 30 years. You might read the Barbie decision, but the French decisions are very short, so that 
took about 20 minutes to read through that one. So I think it was the big, it was like a big, you know, piece. Um, and, and it was very, very uh, interesting. It's, it, it's always interesting to reread the Eisen decision because they're full of discussions about a number of important legal issues. Amongst other things, uh, although it's not, it's not uh, evident at first glance, the Eisen judgment is the first judgment interpreting the provisions of the Genocide Convention. And although he wasn't tried, strictly speaking, under the Genocide Convention, Eisen was tried based on legislation that was enacted in Israel to give effect to the Genocide Convention, and it was called, they were called crimes against the, the Jewish people. The only difference between the, the crimes for which he was prosecuted and the definition of genocide from the 1948 Convention is that there's no debate about the groups, because the Israeli legislation uh, which was retroactive in scope, uh, eliminated the reference to the national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups and focused, uh, focused the concept of genocide exclusively on the, the victim group of the Jewish people of the Second World War. Other than that, it was about the genocide convention. And it was in that context that I first started studying the Eichmann decision really. It was because that was really, that was all there was until the Akeyezu decision of the International Criminal Tribunal for the Court for Rwanda in uh, 1998. Well, I'm not going to talk about all the aspects of the Eichmann decision, only one of them, which is the, the challenge that Eichmann raised to the jurisdiction of the, of the tribunal. Um, Eichmann, as everybody knows, was tried under universal jurisdiction. The crimes he committed were not committed in Israel. Israel didn't even exist when the crimes were, were committed. Uh, and uh, so Israel prosecuted them based on universal jurisdiction. There was a, there was a suggestion in the, in, the, in the two judgments that perhaps there was some concept of the protection of, 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 of passive personality jurisdiction, that the Jews were the victims, this was the Jewish state, and therefore there was some special um, jurisdictional lever at work. But finally, that's not what the judges conclude. They don't base the judgment on that. And the, the explanation, really, that argument just explains the interest of the state of Israel in prosecuting Eichmann, and uh, we see this in other universal jurisdiction cases. Um, Spain uh, tends to focus on former Spanish colonies where they still speak Spanish, and Belgium tends to focus on former Belgian colonies, and uh, so on. So. Israel was just part, part of that phenomenon. Well, the universal jurisdiction idea was, was kind of novel in, in 1951, 19, when they were prosecuting him. And the complication, and I can raise this point, and this was in his challenge, he said, you can't exercise jurisdiction because, universal, because international law doesn't recognize universal jurisdiction over the crime of genocide. And he pointed to the Genocide Convention, which has no provision recognizing universal jurisdiction. And he also pointed to the, the drafting history, the Tzavok Ketahatana of the Genocide Convention, and he said, that shows that, that universal jurisdiction was rejected. So let me just describe what did happen when the Genocide Convention was being adopted. Um, th there are two, two documents, actually, that are adopted in, in the codification of the crime of genocide. There's a General Assembly resolution from December of 1946, which was proposed by Raphael Lemkin in the aftermath of the Nuremberg trial. And, of course, um, it's that resolution that calls upon UN organs then to draft the convention, which was adopted three years later. We have the original draft that, that Lemkin himself apparently prepared, and he found three friendly ambassadors in the General Assembly of the United Nations at the first session, and he wrote their speeches for them, and he gave them this draft. And the draft said, he spoke about universal jurisdiction. He said, whereas uh, less serious crimes, and he refers to trafficking in persons, and pornography, and the classic uh, international crimes, or what today we call the transnational crimes. He said, whereas these crimes are subject to universal jurisdiction, but the more serious crime of genocide is not. He wanted the resolution to recognize that there was universal jurisdiction over the crime of genocide. That was the point of the resolution, was to acknowledge the existence of genocide as a crime, 
and the fact that it could be prosecuted under universal jurisdiction. So the resolution, it's Resolution 96 of the first session of the General Assembly, it's adopted on the 11th of December, 46. It recognizes genocide as an international crime. It calls upon the UN organs through the Secretary General and the Economic and Social Council to draft the convention, but it doesn't recognize the universal jurisdiction over genocide. And there was a, a committee of the General Assembly that discussed this, and we don't have records of the committee. We don't know exactly how it got knocked out, but it got knocked out. And clearly, there were lots of members of the United Nations who didn't like the idea of universal jurisdiction over genocide. The debate resumes when the convention is being adopted, principally in the, in the, third, in the sixth committee rather, of the General Assembly in late 1948, when the final drafting of the convention takes place. There, there's a proposal to recognize universal jurisdiction in the genocide convention. And uh, it's rejected. You know, we have a vote. It's not like today where everything is sort of in the fog of consensus discussion, so you can't really tell what proposals were rejected. You just see you just see a finished product at the end of the negotiation. That's the case with the Rome statute, for example. But back then everything was voted. So there's a proposal to put universal jurisdiction in the genocide dimension, and it's rejected. And it's very clear why. Too many states are opposed to it. They don't want to recognize universal jurisdiction for genocide. This is the beginning of the Cold War. The Russians are afraid that if they recognize universal jurisdiction over genocide, some American courts are going to try and prosecute the Russians for, for genocide. The Americans are afraid that if they recognize universal jurisdiction over genocide, some Russian court is going to prosecute the Americans for genocide. Probably both of them would have had a good case. Um, and and so they say, no way. Keep that out of the discussion. And there's a vote. Nothing could be clearer that the opinion of states, which, which after all is not irrelevant to the discussion of the status of customary law, not entirely irrelevant, one would think. It's the first time ever in the history that there's been a discussion about, about universal jurisdiction over genocide. Levkin himself, who invents the word in 1946, writes this preamble that finally is abandoned, but that says, whereas it's unacceptable that less serious crimes have universal jurisdiction and genocide does not. So he wants Americans to say, it's pretty widely agreed. There's no universal jurisdiction for genocide in 1948. If someone was asked to write a law review article or a student paper or something in 1949, is there universal jurisdiction over genocide? The answer would have to be no, I think. No authority for the contrary position. Israel, they capture Iceland, they bring them to, to Jerusalem, they try them, and Iceland does a motion and says, you can't do this because there's no universal jurisdiction. And he points to the drafting history of the genocide convention. And the judges, the judges say, well, yeah, that's the convention. Yeah, that's the convention, but we're not prosecuting you under the convention. We're prosecuting you under legislation that's derived from customary international law. Customary international law has always recognized that you know you could have universal jurisdiction over such serious crimes. Where is the custom? Well, is there precedence? No, there's never been such prosecution before, so there's no state practice. What about opinion of Europe, the other component of the customary law? Well, you could look at the debates in 1948 for evidence of opinion of Europe, and that would prove the contrary. But they go ahead. And he convicts them, and as you know, he's convicted, the appeal is dismissed, and, and finally he's, uh, he's executed. It's the only time Israel ever imposes the death penalty in its, in its history. And then, an amazing thing happens. One, one could easily have dismissed the same lesson. This was Israel, these were Israeli judges, the whole thing was cooked up, and were they going to do the contrary anyway? Um, did they have a right to intervene when the legislator hold them to exercise universal jurisdiction, that they even have the authority to dismiss it. One could, one could find a way to marginalize that judgment, but instead, it becomes accepted. And today, or even 10 or 20 years ago, if you ask the question, is the universal jurisdiction over genocide, the answer would be, well, of course, the Iceland decision decided it. And so I think it's a very good and interesting example of of judicial activism, if you want, 
you might quarrel with me calling this judicial activism because you could say, well, they were they were put up to it by the Israeli legislature. But the arguments that they use are these are judges who are going way outside the, the, the traditional pattern to explain it and justify it, and they come up with a, a radical result that, that can have a great deal of impact outside of Israel, um, and and it's accepted. And, and I think that's it's, it's one of the features of this body of law that, that judges uh, take the law and move it forward. They jump over barriers that international lawmakers have trouble doing. So the General Assembly in 1948, Lemkin and others, they can't get any traction for universal jurisdiction. It just won't work. And you need some judges to say, forgot that point, customer international law, we're going to recognize it, and then it's over, basically. I would have say it's 100% over. I think even today, someone writing about universal jurisdiction would have to acknowledge that there's, been, there's a study going on in the General Assembly, that there are debates about it, and possibly, and I know there are, there are NGOs who are campaigning for this, they say we should have a protocol for the genocide convention that will um, recognize universal jurisdiction, and I say, don't do that. Just don't, don't get legislators involved in this. It'll get worse. Leave it to judges. They'll move the goalposts much more quickly, and, and people will follow them. So that's what happens with universal jurisdiction. The second example I want to, to, to give is uh, from, uh, this is the famous judgment, the Padish case, the famous Padish jurisdictional decision of uh, the 2nd of October, uh, 1995, the first big decision of the International Criminal Tribunal in the form of the law case. And the decision, I mean, I was looking at all of the case law of the ICC today, and there's not one, there's not one ruling of the ICC in the last eight years since they've been operational, in the last six years since they've been issuing judgment, that comes close to the, you know, the richness and the brilliance of that, that decision. Of course, we know part of the reason that the, the authors were extraordinary people, first and foremost among them, the late Antonio Cassetti. Uh, but there were others who participated in the, the decision. Um, uh, George Aguitard, who, who wrote part of the decision. I had the pleasure of, of uh, having a long chat with George Aguitard, who was on that appeals chamber, at, in The Hague a few months ago at the, one of, at the, the commemoration ceremony for uh, Professor Cassetti. And we were talking about this, and I was asking him about that decision and how it was uh, adopted. And he said, well, the, the trial chamber issued their decision at the beginning of, uh, of August. I think it was the 18th, the 10th of August, 19, uh, uh, that's 1995. And then they issued their decision, a great decision, a couple hundred pages long, I suppose, 150 pages long, within six or seven weeks. You know, I, I mean, at the ICC, they can't issue a, an interlocutory decision on uh, leave to appeal within six or seven weeks. You know, some trivial matter takes longer than that. And here they come up with the most brilliant decision of our time within six or seven weeks. And I asked that before, how did you do it? Do you think it's because the legal officers worked overtime on the weekends writing it and a whole team of He said, no. He said, I wrote the first part and Nino wrote the second part. <laughs> you know, to experience academics go home on the weekend and get out because I don't think either of these guys, at least at that time, worked on laptops. <laughs> and they wrote it out and you have this great decision. So let me just draw your attention to one feature of the, of the decision that, that I think is also a, a demonstration of this point. And that's the, um, the interpretation of the subject matter jurisdiction of the, of the international of the statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. That statute was drafted in uh, the space of a few weeks in 1993 by lawyers working in the Office of Legal Affairs of the United Nations in New York. <coughs> None of them had done this before. Nobody had studied this. I went to law school pre-1993 and I can tell you there were no courses on international criminal law. There were very few books in the libraries on the subject. You could go to a physical university library, probably here, and you would have a little shelf about that long with about seven books, uh, all published by transnational publishers and all authored by Sharif Bassi and that was in, in 1993. 
So they prepared this uh, uh, this draft, and they they said, well, they've been they decided that there was going to be a problem with retroactivity because they were although the war was continuing initially, the idea was to deal with the atrocities that had already taken place. So the way they said they were going to address that was that this statute was not going to innovate, but that they were only going to uh, prosecute crimes that were clearly identified as being part of customer international law. They were unquestionably part of customer international law, and that goes in the Secretary General's report that's, that, that, that accompanies the statute. And it says that, and the judges have regularly referred to that phrase. Some of them, I think, have misread it because some of them think that it means that they apply customary international laws. Not actually the case. They apply their statute, but they interpret it within the framework of customary international law because that was the intent of the Security Council when it was adopted. <coughs> so, um, in, in those definitions, they went to war crimes. And they took the existing war crimes law that dates to the 1940s. They took the great breaches regime from the Geneva Conventions of 1949, and they put them in uh, Article 3, uh, Article 2 rather, and they took the laws or customs of war, which were derived from the Nuremberg provisions, and they tweaked them a little bit in light of the post Second World War case law, and that became Article 3. So they had two provisions which was interesting, it was like a bit of the belt and suspenders phenomenon. It wasn't clear why they needed two of them, but it was because they thought they were codifying existing customary law uh, as manifested in the Nuremberg trial and in the, um, in the Great Breach provisions of the Geneva Convention. Um, and uh, the other thing that they did was in Article 4, which dealt with five, rather, crimes against humanity, they said, well, in Nuremberg, there has been this debate over the years about whether there's a connection between crimes against humanity and armed conflict. That was the case of Nuremberg. So just to be safe, they put in the definition that it had to be committed in association with the armed conflict. And along comes Kasevi and Abhisab and the others, and they basically just worked that up. And they said, and it was a uh, uh, this was a short part of the judgment, but extremely influential. They said, uh, as for crimes against humanity, it's clear that that part in the statute that the Security Council put in the definition is inconsistent with customary international law, and that customary international law no longer requires a link between crimes against humanity and our own conflict. And that was huge. And people cite that to this day. And uh, that was then picked up. They, they enabled the, the international legislator then to move forward. That propelled the drafters of the Rome Statute very quickly to dispose of that issue. Had they not done that, the Rome Statute would probably have a link between crimes against humanity and Iron Cross. It's hard to say. There were still a few countries at the Rome, at the conference <laughs> Rome, who argued that there was this link and that that belonged in the Rome Statute. But the judgment in Padditch is a huge amount to moving that debate, that debate forward. With respect to war crimes, this becomes, intellectually, this is almost, this is more difficult intellectually, except the judges just had to tidy up the statute. And they said, you know, actually, Article 3 of the statute of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, which is laws or customs of war, and which was clearly derived from Nuremberg, they said, this is a broad provision that deals with all serious violations of international humanitarian law. In one fell swoop, they made Article 2, which was the great breach of provision, completely useless, superfluous. There's no reason to have included it. And those who follow the Yugoslavia Tribunal know that the judges and the prosecutor first very quickly abandoned the prosecution based on the great breach of the it was just an added complication that wasn't very important. But it, it wasn't really coherent. I can remember in, in 1999 when the Kosovo conflict, the bombing of, of Yugoslavia arose, and, uh, and there was a debate about what the, whether, the US, whether the Yugoslavia tribunal could actually have jurisdiction over, the, over, the, over alleged crimes committed by NATO. And I think it's clear that they could exercise jurisdiction. So what would those crimes be? And when you look through the body of international humanitarian law, you very quickly focus on 
uh, Protocol 1 to the Geneva Convention, which was adopted in 1977. Because that's, that's the, it's the framework for dealing with things like uh, bombing, aerial bombing, which is maybe what was going on. So uh, I was intrigued by this because we had in the, in the statute of the Yugoslavia Tribunal Article 2, which deals with great reaches of the Geneva Convention, but doesn't mention Protocol 1, which has its own great reach permission, or Article 3, which talks about serious violations of, well, violations of the laws of customs of war, interpreted by the Tadic uh, Appeals Chamber to be broad enough to cover all serious violations of international humanitarian law. But it didn't really make sense that a coherent legislator would have taken, would have had intended to put the, series, the violations of Protocol 1 in Article 3 of violations of the law of the customs of war, when at the same time a, a provision was adopted on great breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. It would just be incoherent, it wouldn't be logical. But I wasn't sure of the answer. At that point, there were two uh, textbooks on the Yugoslavia statute, one by Michael Sharp and the other by Shuri Fasuni. And uh, so I consulted those textbooks. Neither of them answered the question. Neither of them said, now there's an interesting problem. Where does Protocol 1 fit in Article 2 or Article 3 of the statute? And neither of them did. So I, I, I knew them both and wrote to them and asked for, uh, you know, just a little uh, oversight in your book. You didn't mention this. Where would they belong? And uh, I, I can't remember Vasuni. He wrote back saying he thought they were in Article 3. But Sharp didn't answer me. <laughs> and I wrote him back about three weeks later and said, Michael, you know, where did they belong? And he said, I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> so I, I'm just giving that. I don't mean to, to disparage either of them because they're great. Both of them are great scholars. And I, I just want to make the point that it was incoherent. The statute of the Yugoslavia Tribunal was, was incoherent in the area of war crimes, and the judges just swooped in and tidied it up. And they did a brilliant job, and they remade the, the law in, in doing so. I have just one other example, Michael. Yeah. Would you give me just five minutes that, 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 is, that is drawn? Now, now I'm really stretching the scope of, of the international humanitarian law, but I think it will. It, it adds to my point about the, about the role of judges in this process. And that's about the concept of, uh, of refoulement, uh, which uh, is closely associated with torture, which I suppose is broadly speaking within our framework of international humanitarian law. So again, compare the treaties with what the judges do. You have uh, um, a couple of, I guess now three treaties with the enforced disappearance uh, treaty. That, that had provisions on refoulement. So you have the Refugee Convention of 1951, which says no refoulement for, uh, for, for a refugee to a state where they would be subject to persecution, but there's an exception uh, if they're a threat to national security, which is a pretty big hole. Uh, or if they've committed, a, I think, a particular, it's a particularly serious crime. So, you know. And, and you have to be a refugee. It doesn't apply if you're not a refugee. It only benefits a refugee. So if you're not a refugee, you're an asylum seeker or just, and, and you're going to be sent back to a country where you'd be persecuted or tortured, the Refugee Convention doesn't help. But that's what, that's what legislators do, international legislators, when they agree on a treaty. Um, then we have the Torture Convention. And the Torture Convention has a provision on non refoulement but Although it's been held by the Committee Against Torture to apply to torture, they've also said it only applies to torture, according to the Convention, and doesn't apply to cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment. So, refoulement, when someone would be subject to cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment, seems to be acceptable under the Torture Convention. At least it doesn't prohibit it. So, these are narrow provisions, finally, that, and that's the positive law on, uh, on refoulement. So, what do judges do with it? And, and here I'm moving outside the judges who would exercise jurisdiction over either the Refugee Convention or the, uh, uh, or the, the uh, Convention Against Torture going to the European Court of Human Rights. And the, European, the judges of the European Court of Human Rights who only apply the European Convention on Human Rights, and it doesn't say anything about reform. But the judges just made it up. 
I mean, they just consider that, but that's part of their jurisdiction, is to protect people against refoulement. And does it just apply to refugees? And does it have a loophole for, uh, for uh, national security threats and so on? Not at all. It applies to everybody. And does it apply just to torture? No. It applies to torture. It applies to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. It applies to violations of the right to life. It applies, apparently now, according to the latest case law, to the threat of a, of a, of a, a seriously unfair, manifestly unfair trial. So it's huge compared to what you get out of the torture convention and the refugee convention, and it's silent on the subject. So my general theory about international law is try not to codify it. Just give it to judges and let them fly. And uh, I think that we have many examples of it, and it, it, it doesn't happen that way uh, at the national level. There's a little bit more, a little bit of judicial creativity, but, but it is something that's particular to international law, and especially to this field of, well, we'll call it international humanitarian law, which I'm, I'm giving a, a broad uh, scope to. Um, but judges just take it, and they innovate, and they're creative, and the amazing thing is, generally, states effective. So that when it comes time then to codify, like in the Rome Statute, the starting point is what the judges did, and these innovative, innovative judgments that legislators, international legislators, diplomatic conferences would never have agreed to. So, I think I'll, okay, I've said about it, and it's over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, before I realized I was going to be speaking this evening, I actually had an exchange email with Charlie Gary, who's supposed to be the FC. Um, um, he said, I know exactly what Bill did today. You know what? I'm going to say some provocative things this evening. I remember when I heard he wasn't able to make it tonight, I thought, you know what? I'm going to have to fly the flag and tell him yeah. um, challenge Bill on um, on his analysis, but also in the far as, you know, all the examples, and it's not that I don't disagree with you completely, but all the examples you point to are examples of judicial activism where we're looking at progressive developments in the law that have good outcomes, and we as liberals, as human rights advocates, fully support these outcomes. But that's not always the case, because sometimes judges okay, resort to judicial activism, and the consequence of the law isn't really what we want. And actually, sometimes, in a particular situation where we are faced with a greater problem than that which we originally encountered. So, the first example that came to mind was a case that you've probably discussed in your classes if you're all international lawyers here, um, and it's a case of Algeria. Okay, I think perhaps many of you are familiar with that. It was the European Court ruled on it in July or in 2011. Um, they, they issued the ruling in conjunction with another case that we all international lawyers have been waiting for some time for our scheming on jurisdiction. But our gender concerned internment in armed conflict. Um, compared to us, the EU, which has actually got a huge amount of coverage in terms of scholarly bodies of economy, our agenda has had very little. And yet our gender is hugely, hugely problematic, especially for items or Notably, lawyers and really changing problematic to states and how to deal with internment. So, if I could just give you a little bit of background for those of you who aren't aware of this particular case, Al Jaffa was a dual national, Iraqi British national, who was interned on the basis of imperative reasons of security by UK forces in Badra in Iraq between October 2004 and December 2007. And it was also that British authorities believed him to have been personally responsible for recruiting terrorists 
outside of love, with a view to the commission of accused atrocities there, etc., etc. I won't go into the details. So they interned him, okay? And they hold him in a detention camp in the background. As I said, return was subject to a review process. I won't go into details unless you want to discuss this in the time q a but it was a fairly rigorous detailed review process conducted with the British military and then lastly involving the Iraqi um, authorities as well. <coughs> Our paper was released from internment in December 2007. Subsequently, he lost an appeal against an order depriving him of British nationality or British citizenship in 2009 following a fire hearing. Again, I'm going to go into that, but it's not directly relevant. Okay, so, what happens is Al Jagger brings a claim in the English court uh, on the basis that his internment by the UK forces in Iraq was in breach of Article 5.1 of the European Convention. Okay? It goes through the English court and the English court actually ruled in favour of the government and it eventually appealed to the European Court. Article 5.1, just for those of you who aren't aware of what it is, it guarantees the right to liberty and security of a person but limits six committed reasons to depriving an individual of their liberty. But, and that's according to law. What it doesn't do is mention the um, internment or detention in the context of um, armed conflict for imperative reasons of security. This is clearly the European Convention is designed for accessibility in peacetime. So it's inapplicable in the context of armed conflict, so it's not going to mention internment. So, once it gets up to the European courts, a government has two arguments. The first argument is that internment was not attributable to the UK but to the UN. Um, and therefore, I guess it was never in UK jurisdiction. That can be rejected and rightly so. Alternatively, the government argues that our chairman's internment was carried out pursuant to the Security Council Resolution. 1546, which created an obligation on the UK to detain our chairman. The Security Council resolution in question authorized multinational forces in Iraq to take all necessary measures to contribute to the maintenance of security and stability in Iraq at the time, and that those measures also included detention. Nonetheless, detention was only mentioned in a letter that was annexed to the Security Council resolution, and it was one that was issued between, or rather issued, um, between the Secretary of State, the US Secretary of State, <coughs> and the Iraqi Prime Minister. Okay? So the government, the UK government, argued the UK's obligations under Article 5 of the European Convention were displaced by the legal regime that was created under the Security Council resolution. And they furthermore added the charter obligation under um, Article 1 and 3 of the UN Charter prevailed over other international obligations, including the obligations vis-a-vis -vis other European member states. Okay? So this includes Security Council resolution obliging states to act in a particular way and decisions to authorise them to do so. So the court then reasons this. They say the key question um, is whether Resolution 1546 places the UK under an obligation to hold the applicant as gender in internment. It goes on to say the Security Council could not have intended to impose any obligation on member states to breach fundamental human rights obligations. 
they look at them with all the security camps and the UN and the whole, and they say, you know what, you know, it, they could possibly mean for them to have been breached, given what the whole you know, objective of the UN system is. They look at the security camps and revolution, and they say, you know what, this is not ambiguous. The language is ambiguous in the security council revolution, and the court has to decide, they have to choose between interpreting or, or putting forward an interpretation that is the most in harmony with the European Convention. So, then, can we examine the laws that apply in our context, in our way, I am chair. And here I'm referring to international and saying very narrowly to mean the laws of war. What does the court mean? It looks at the Geneva Conventions, it looks at the series of articles, that's 27, 21, 22, 23, and 78 of GT4. And all these provisions refer to internment in the context of the international armed conflict. But the court then says, it does not find it established that international humanitarian law places an obligation on an occupying power to use indefinite internment without trial. It then says, in the court's view, it would appear from the provisions of the Geneva Convention that under international humanitarian law, internment is to be viewed not as an obligation, but as a measure of last resort. So the court, they um, conclude that there's no conflict between the UK's obligations and the UN Charter, and um, that the detention was in breach of Article 5 as well. Now, let's consider, reconsider what this means. So, for me, this is a form of judicial activism that's going on. And some people say, well, you know what, the court has to find it, because it is the um, court that looks human rights conventions, if duty wasn't look really at IHL at the laws of armed conflict, it had to decide within its mandate. Nonetheless, the Council of Armed Conflict came to the second view. Do you look at the laws of armed conflict? And maybe if there was a duty on it to interpret it according to the reasoning of the laws of armed conflict. So what are the consequences then of this particular judgment? It's this. If European Convention member states don't want to violate the European Convention obligation, in future they will have to secure some kind of resolution that clearly and explicitly okay, states the basis of detention and the procedures of detention in armed conflict so that it doesn't um, conflict with their obligation under the European Convention. So, this then raises a huge problem because when you go back to the Geneva Convention, there are laws there. Are those laws were followed, whether you like them or not, by the UK authorities in Bastra. And um, the big question this raises is, is the European Court then suggesting that the Security Council begins to legislate in matters of internment, okay? Is there is already an existing body of law that is agreed by all state parties to the Geneva Convention, and I would argue that every single state party Instead of relying on that body of law, we now, according to the European Court, they rely on the Security Council to determine the basis and the procedures for internment that are authorised under the Security Council Chapter 7 Resolution. That does this mean that they're going to be two sets of regulations, one governing certain types of internment that are authorised on the Security Council, determined by laws made up by 15 member states on the Security Council, and another set of laws that apply 
came directly to our face by virtue of conventional obligation and consumer international in law, so it's time to all other sides to be determined. So, I need to set that to the one side, but I need to come back to it. This is a situation where I think, you know what, this is judicial activism, and yes, the human rights court may have, the European court may have had human rights at the back of their mind to protect the individual who has been interned indefinitely. Nonetheless, the decisions and reasonings are operating in the context of the law of armed conflict and detention is quite distinct from human rights. Okay? Because okay, if you were going to suggest that that same system applies to civilians who are going to be interned in armed conflict, then it raises another question. Does that mean we have to revise the internment or our procedures and basis of in respect to all peer studies as well? Okay? And this then sort of opens up all sorts of questions that we perhaps or to explore later on. The second issue, or rather the second issue that I want to quickly turn to, because I, I, I really want to be, I, I, I want to sort of challenge this thing with this thinking that some of judicial activism is only good, and it requires good. Now, this is an area that uh, Charles and I have had for many, many years argued over, and I have been a big um, promoter, or rather, I have been a big critic of the tribal, political tribal, which are not unlawful under the law as it currently is understood. This became an issue in two cases before the LPC1, I think you'll probably be aware of them, Prescott and Marcus. Um, and of course, what then being active, judicial activism, in Marcus, they say the rule which states that the tribal against the civilian population as such, or individual civilians, are prohibited in all circumstances, even when confronted by wrongful behavior <coughs> of the other party, is an integral part of customary international law, unlike irrespective in all armed conflict. In compressive, the, the core supports it, and we have heard this fact, or this, this, this um, assumption, that somehow, on the customary international law, religious reprisal against civilians is prohibited. Now, uh, you will probably remember that when the Eastern Court spoke of the customary law or customary status of the prohibition, we had maybe four or five leading academics quickly take pen and paper or both of their laptops and write papers saying how misguided the court was. So it was completely wrong, and all they had to do was to look at the case, that is, we do say as a reservation to particular um, um, position on this kind of source, and that the court had misinterpreted okay, what country international law was. That is quite a separate question from whether or not one supports the existence of the right of states to resort to religion reprisal. It is what, uh, whether or not a law has reached that status is of the accustoming or not. Now, my concern at that stage was, until that point, until the ICTY actually referred to the custody status of religion reprisal, it was kind of a trend, I would say, was going towards a general sense that the kind of position of the was not on the state were proud to declare their continued support for it. And had the court not made an express statement, they wouldn't have had lawyers come out to say, you know what, actually that's not what the law is. And in fact, it's, it's actually been counterproductive, in my view, that when you have a trend that was moving towards a 
great enthusiasm. These people not talking about this issue. Only if it was something that was regarded as being um, a, a, a form of behavior that most states did not want to enter into, we now have states having to reassert the right to, in extreme circumstances, resort to political reprisal. Finally, I want to come back to Tadic, the case that you referred to me. Yes, Tadic did some wonderful things. Nonetheless, there is one aspect of Tadic that has always concerned me, has always troubled me. And it is this that, yes, you're right, in the statute we go back to it and see great, um, great creatures. And the problem with Tadic is that, as I, as I can see, the prophet minister had charged Tadic for account under Article 2. And the problem that faced the court was, you know what, great breaches was only available in the context of the international armed conflict. And therefore the court had to back and it came up with and then judicial creativity in action, the concept of overall control. So we now argue in our classes over in court service, is it effective control, is it overall control? And it comes down to Tadich. And I want to say that, and today, you know, I'm not suggesting that we go back now, because we, we've now moved forward. But I want to say that, have we realized what the problems might have been? We might not have embraced that as warmly as we did at the time, and perhaps we would have said, well, you know what, that particular charge was simply unstable. If you want to charge this guy, charge him with all kinds, but not grave breaches. So they are in. Thank you. I'm going to throw it right back to you. Um, if you want to make a response. Uh, yeah. Just a couple of comments on this. Um, because the, I, I'm on, on Tadich, I'm speaking about that judgment of uh, October 95, and, and really uh, the, the main point there was about the, the interpretation of Article 2 and 3. And, um, Plus, plus the crimes against humanity part. And the big breakthrough was acknowledging war crimes in, uh, in non international armed conflict. Which I think the prosecutor wasn't sure about it at all. Um, Bill Fender, who was on um, the prosecutor's team, was the, sort of the key, even sort of Charles Garraway of the Canadian Armed Forces thing. I think Bill once said that so we went into that appeal chamber uh, asking for a stake. And I say he gave us the whole cow. You know, they got a lot more than they actually thought they were ever in, in that position. I, I remember that my real introduction to human rights monitoring was going to Rwanda in 1993, and we wrote a report where we talked about war crimes in Rwanda, and I got chewed out by a leading human rights NGO guy in the States for writing it because he said, You don't know anything about humanitarian law. Everybody knows there's no such thing as war crimes in the in the non-international armed conflict. So the the tax decision, I mean, it was was huge. I mean, the the, the issue of reprisal, uh, the compressive issue, that, that is, as I recall, you know, yeah. well, on that. I mean, he's there's a hand in the saving and that one too, and then some of these other things. But I don't see the harm the way you do, actually. I I mean. I was expecting that from Charles actually to raise that because I think it's a peculiarly British obsession. <laughs> you know, I think it's only. I don't think it's so Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, you know, there is a, this, this reservation on on the, because the the prohibition of reprisals in positive law is in the Third Convention dealing with prisoners of war, and then it's dealing with civilians in Protocol um, in Protocol One, and uh, but you know. It's, uh, it's one of my sort of uh, questions for, for students who think that there's an absolute prohibition on all forms of reprisal in international humanitarian law, which I don't think there probably is. You know, against other combatants, you probably can carry out reprisal mm -hmm. as long as they're not prisoners. But that's not what bothers the British. They come in protocol one and say, no, we reserve the right to carry out reprisals on civilians. 
They object to a provision, and this, this isn't a test who started the fight. This is protocol one, and they object to it. And then they make, and it's a statement, I think. It's like an understanding they make when they ratify the Rome statute, where they recall the, 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 uh, the uh, I think they refer to the Kuskevich case. But certainly they recall their reservation uh, up to the uh, to protocol one. Well, I don't know. I, I think you have other countries done this. I think this is just a test. I think, I think and, I said, and I said the hand was brought up narrowly in the British. No, no, I, I think the United States is going to be easier to say. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they, they didn't do it when they ratified the wrong statute. <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't yeah. ratify the wrong statute. <laughs> And they didn't so, grab yeah, the yeah, yeah. one time. I, I think, you know, you and I probably don't disagree on less reprisals as we can't. There's the idea that we still have reprisals that, 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 that you know, the armed forces can deliberately target the civilian population as we have last, last report. See, we can't to us. Nonetheless, okay, there is that question then, well, you know, it, if that is the case, we dare would need to lobby the government to change their position on that. But is it up to a judge sitting in the hay whatever, to suggest that in spite of positive action by the state, reiterating, reaffirming the right to continue to uphold that doctrine, is it right for a judge to? with it or to even begin to argue it with with faith. And I guess that that's really mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not worried about the you know the propriety of the judge doing it. Because I just see generally thought of a result. Sometimes judges don't do it, of course. There's no shortage of examples of judicial inactivism. Yeah. Uh, we had a great one a month ago at the International Court of Justice in the German uh, versus Navy case about communities where the, you know, the judges just took straight conservative traditional position on immunity. So there are lots of examples, and, okay. and that's a, it's not a humanitarian law issue exactly, but it deals with pretty good force that is kind of, uh, that's the root of the, of the case of the International Court of Justice. But I generally see good coming from it. And, uh, I mean, I'm quite interested because you did you seem to distinguish between domestic courts and international courts. So somehow in the international arena, it's okay for judges to do this. This is part of their role, duty, whatever. But it's different in domestic courts. Is that right? You know, if Judge yeah. Macy were with us today, he would say, and he wrote, he wrote about this, but he would say that, uh, that international law does move differently than national law, because in national law you have legislators who are sitting there on full time, and if you need to change the law somehow, you, you can do it relatively easily. And but international law can't work the same way, so there's a there's a special rule for for judges. Yeah, I think that's Garagon's and his actors in Spain for judicial activism and the uh, thing over that stuff in it. Yeah, although I don't think of him as being, I don't know that he's, he's such an, an activist in terms of changing the law. He's just, he, he's an activist. He's an activist, or a hyperactive <laughs> judge. Uh, but, but he's, you know, we don't know, I don't know if you ever read a judgment by Garcon. I've never seen him quoted where someone says, according to Judge Garcon, you know, in a footnote, uh, this, you know, he, he picks other people to prosecute and he goes at them. But I, he's not a, um, He's not a jurist in the sense of developing the law in the same way. Um, you know, it's the thing that got him in all the hot water in uh, Spain was a very interesting legal question because he was trying to prosecute crimes against humanity in peacetime uh, after the after Franco had come to power in, in 1939, and no one's done that. No one's gone that far back. You know, there are there are a few prosecutions down in Eastern Europe in Estonia and, um, and elsewhere in the post-1945 period for crimes against humanity in, in peacetime. And uh, actually, one of just about five years ago, sorry to keep talking on, but he, was, he made a huge contribution. And 
He wrote an article in his journal, the Journal of International Criminal Justice, complaining about the European Court of Human Rights, saying that they should have at least addressed the question. Mm -hmm. He said it was the judges just didn't, weren't even aware that there was a debate about whether crimes against humanity could be committed in peacetime in, I think, 1948 or 49. Um, but so Garcia was doing that, but I, I never saw anything where he developed a theory or anything. I think it's just sort of a bulldozer theory of try it and yeah. throw it and throw it spit. And I might take up to the open to the choice. If anybody has a question? Go ahead. Um, Actually, we might take a couple of questions and pick up. Yeah. Okay. So, if you want to go, and then you and Danny. Um, well, the same I'm going to share that just shows that uh, I want to tell you that you, a lot of them quite quickly just drew kind of stark comparison between the uh, the judges in the Rubanga judgment today and uh, yeah, the CY judges in the Dutch case. And it, um, it made me think that um, if what you say about judicial activism being essential and essentially a very good thing is to happen, then, I mean, it's just what I'm saying, we need good judges. Now, I, I was in New York for the Assembly of State Parties meeting when six new judges were elected to the SEC, and I'd say the process could be characterized as charitably a mess. Um, and part of this is because there's a, um, there are competing approaches between the best judges and the region they come from, the, their legal background, a whole host of other characteristics. So I'm just wondering one, if you wanted to comment on whether that is something that you think is, is valuable, whether we should be electing judges purely on the basis of publication or it, um, based on what you're talking about, or whether we should uh, have a whole other set of criteria for that election. Okay, I want to follow up on that uh, similar question, which was uh, less about selecting individual judges, but you are pointing to, you know, to the <coughs> first big case of the Yugoslavia the first big international prison tribunal case of the Yugoslavia tribunal, and you're speaking about the Eichmann case. Um, and as you mentioned, there was only a handful of books in international criminal law, people weren't studying it, but there were no international criminal lawyers. The, the judges that are coming through now and in the future, this is a whole new class of people who've been trained since their youth, you know, uh, to be put to aim for a certain position. And is that going to change radically the, the space open to judges to engage in judicial activism? You know, like all the fun, we have all the fun and you can now you can have Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, please. Um, we'll say thanks very much for the really interesting talk. Um, just a quick question. Um, when you talk about judicial activism in a positive manner, isn't it also important to consider the potentially negative consequence on the right to be accused, and then with that, the general legitimacy of the international criminal legal system? Because surely, with every praised liberal judgment, which is potentially a good thing for the victim, does that not? Um, Consequently, you also, to some extent, negatively impact on the rights of the accused. Um, Thank you. Danny. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I, I think what we always come back to is uh, the, the uniqueness, the dimension of international law, where states essentially create the law to govern themselves. They're the, they're the legislators and the subjects of the law. So they get really upset when judges do things that they, didn't, that they don't want them to do or to make new rules that they didn't all get to agree to. I wonder outside of the European Court of Human Rights decisions where a group of states have given over some of their sovereignty to have decisions made and to interpret this law. It's it really essential to where states have been persuaded by rules that have come out through judicial activism to not do something that they want to do. Okay, I one more. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much for the talk. I want to ask um, whether it's, whether we should be considering these individual these cases as judicial activism, whether uh, as uh, opposed to you know political activism. I'll preface this in saying I'm an international relations <coughs> scholar, but these people that you mentioned in particular, the Irishman, I mean, I would consider maybe norm entrepreneurs more than judicial activists. I understand that they're just judicial activists 
insofar as they're, they're judges, uh, but they're shaping the very politics of international relations and they're legalizing international relations in a particular fashion, which might, in my, it, it seems a great argument to make that they're, they're shaping the politics of international law much more actually than the international legal realm of politics. Okay. Um, the question I was to is about um, a judgment with quarters actually becoming to prevent, to, to actually limit the state from doing what perhaps it would want to claim to. I think actually we've seen this in the United States in the of judgments there, um, pertaining to what kind of um, the, what law applies to um, U.S. troops abroad who are uh, involved in armed um, conflict. Um, and I think that if it wasn't for the activism on the part of the Supreme Court there, that certainly under the, the previous administration, the military would have gone further. Um, so, so, yes, the, the then is not really an international court of that, it is a domestic court heading back to the legislative. And I think this is, this is you know, what we're doing here, trying to, uh, to, to deconstruct all these different relationships that are going on between national and international, between what is the role of, you know, whether we talk about politically um, appointed judges, you know, are they, are they, who they, responsible to who they're accountable to. Is this about politics? Is it really about law? What if it, in the context of domestic, um, uh, domestic paradigm, you know, are, are judges supposed to be interpreting? Are, are international judges, judges supposed to be legislating? You know, all these questions I think are unresolved and yet yeah, kind of muddled through. But I think it's really important that we have these conversations because I guess we know what, what everyone is supposed to be doing, we just kind of muddle on, and I don't think that's good enough, actually, because we get bad and all that way. <laughs> the first question about the judges was very interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a delicate matter. Um, I'm prepared to talk candidly about it in this room, but I, I'll deny everything to quote me on this. You know, I know it's being recorded, so you have to be sensitive about it. Um, let me, um, you know, if you have to do, we, we could do this, if I have to, I mean, I don't know, I suppose everybody, not everybody here is trained in the, in the English legal system, but whatever, if you, those who are, or those who are very familiar with it, I ask you to name the top five judges in the last 50 years. We probably, the same names would come up, okay? People have a list of very familiar names, and we know how to identify a great judge, and it would be because of, the, of the, 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 the eloquence of the judgment, the approach to interpreting the law, and so on, and, and we would be able to identify them. Um, and the same in the United States, you could look at the U.S. Supreme Court judgments and pick out top five, and you could probably do that in most other legal systems. So look at the international criminal law system and go for the top five or the top ten. So where would they come from? Or let me put it another way, how many of them would come from the ICC? How many of them would be on the top list from the international criminal court? Don't say nothing. <laughs> I'm just for the microphone. I'm just repeating the word I heard from the audience. <laughs> Part of the problem is, is actually, and you can see this if you compare international courts and tribunals, um, who's practicing to run for office. So, uh, you know, if you look at the International Court of Justice, if there's a vacancy on the International Court of Justice, the top international lawyers in the world are prepared to sell their mothers into slavery <laughs> to get on to the International Court of Justice. Um, you don't see them queuing up to get on to the ICC. It maybe is part of just the sort of the morale problem of the institution and 
people looking at it saying, do you really want to spend nine years of my life issuing interlocutory decisions about whether a victim is qualified for, you know, uh, for, for reparations or something like that? Uh, and, and, and I think that was probably reflected in the elections that you witnessed uh, of, the, of the people. And again, I don't want to be disparaging of any particular individual because there are some fine people and there were some fine people who were elected um, at the, in last December. But it doesn't attract the stellar candidates. Um, and if, you know, my top list, again, if I'm thinking of the top judges, uh, obviously it's the thing you would be there. I mean, that was, you know, a one judgment wonder, but he was part of that kind of decision. But there are others who played, who were great judgments and made great con contributions but they tend to be clustered around the ICPY, I right? think. Um, and maybe it's maybe one or two of the special courts of Sierra Leone. We have a couple of good ones and a couple of horrible ones there. But, but the ICC is kind of pretty ordinary, pretty bland uh, right now. And hopefully I will change. But I think part of it is, a, is just attracting them and then the, the states don't go out and, and work hard at this. But I think really the problem is that what you want is the top judges. <laughs> you know, you want the top judges here in the UK saying, you know, I've been a judge here for 10 years. It's either the Supreme Court, but really, I really want the big judge. At the US Lobby Tribunal, you had some of that. There was a man on, the, on that bench in Paris who people had forgotten, most people don't know him, but I, I knew him well because he was a, he was a Canadian, he was a Quebecois, Jules Deschamps. And Judge Shen sat on that, he was part of that five judge appeals chamber panel, and he was on some other decisions as well. But he was, he would be one of the great judges, certainly in, in Canada. And um, he had the ambition to be an international judge, and he was happy to be there at the U.S. Lobby Tribunal. I bet there are lots of judges here, if you want to. And we had, we had, well, I'll give you one example. The first judge elected to the ICC, Maureen Clark, Irish judge. She was elected, she was the very first. I mean, she got the top number of votes in the first election on the first ballot, way before the men got elected, Maureen came first. And she was on the court for a few years, and they had no work for her. And uh, then the Irish came along and said, we'll make you a high court judge. This is what they did with Fulford as well. Fulford's a British judge, he was elected, but there was no work for him. And they, but they said when they elected, they said, we're going to make you a high court judge as well. And, and so he sat on some cases here, and uh, he had that. But they went to, it was a few years before Maureen Clark got made a judge of the high court. And then they found some problem in the Irish law that she couldn't sit on both at the same time. She couldn't be a high court judge and an international judge. And so they said, choose. And guess what she chose? The high court. You know, divorce. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, she found that to be more, that was a real job. And she's been a fine judge in Ireland and all of that. But, you know, that's sad when that happens. It's, it's not, it doesn't have that. that the, I think one of the speakers that I see, someone from the audience, um, raised this possibility because it's about the generation thing. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, because I now look at the judges. For example, the, the English judge, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the English judge, um, Harold Morrison. Um, I actually, that, that's who I worked with um, when I was um, doing some defense work with it. And I remember that this was at the very beginning when the ICT one was first established. Um, uh, his, I mean, it, it, it was a real steep learning curve in international law. And he, he actually brought me on because I just completed my parallel international one. It was like, wow, you know something about international criminal law, this sort of mysterious. He was, just, he was trained as an English judge and he did criminal law and he was you know, a circuit judge. Um, and so it's, it's really a, a generation thing that until you know, his generation has come and gone and it's the next generation that has come up through the university, through the court system, where you know, there's a bank of people who are you know, qualified lawyers, who are also experts in international law, who then say, do you know what, this is my calling, I really want to do this. And so, you know, we're still seeing that the tail end of judges, you know, the domestic judges, who are 
Yes, but the same judge, if you want to say that there's a vacant seat on the International Court of Justice, they jump out of their chair. It's about the courts, it's about the tribunal, I think, and it's about the different. You can compare them. <coughs> you can compare them by the kind of people who are attracted to them. And, and well, I love that there's those judges that go for the ICT are primarily academics who have specialized in international law. I don't know. Well, well, I see this. <laughs> um, there was another question. There was the, the question about the, the right to the accused. And, um, you know, I, the Tadish decision certainly broadened out the law. And there's a provision in the Rome Statute that, that says that the, um, uh, the, the, it's a, the principle we all know from criminal law that the definitions of the crimes would be to, in, to be interpreted restrictively and analogy is not permitted and so on in Article 22. And uh, of course there's nothing about interpretation in the Yugoslavia statute. But if there was such a provision in the Yugoslavia statute, it's hard to imagine how they would have come up with what they did in the Paris decision. That was a purpose of the decision. Um, that, that, but so what's the harm, frankly? I, I don't, to me, it's the fun to talk about the right to be accused. If you're a defense lawyer, yeah, that complicates your life a little bit. But that's not, you know, Tavish was guilty. He had a war crime. He had atrocities in an in internal armed conflict. Well, what's the harm in it? And I don't have a big problem with that. And of course, uh, if we want, we're talking in the, that there are other litigants in the process as well, there are victims. So I would just put it all in terms of this is going to harm the rights of the accused. Sometimes it's going to be to the benefit of the rights of the accused, by the way. But sometimes for the benefit of the rights of the victims. I, I think it, it can work in both directions. Um, you know, when uh, when uh, Judge Holford uh, in his trial chamber on two occasions threatened to throw the whole case against Lubanga, I think it's pretty good for the rights of the person. You know, now finally, it got fixed. They were overturned by the Eagles Chamber, remember. But that was a kind of judicial activism. Not so much about applying the law, but it was about going into a into a, a, a into law. And I dare say that if 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 Holford were to remain in the court, this is going to be his last case. And I'm sure he wants to come back here and, and be a high court or an appeals court judge. But if he were to remain there, he, he would probably take another bite out of the prosecutor before he was finished. I, I, I gather those of you who've seen the, the video of the Final pleadings in the Lubanga case will know that uh, there was no love loss between the uh, prosecutor and, and, uh, and Judge Fulford. Um, there was just one other comment that I, I, I mentioned that I can't even read my own writing. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, your question about, uh, about uh, judges, whether it's judicial activism or whether they're um, the, the political dimension of it. Um, I mean, again, going back to Tadich, I'm sure, I think in both cases, in both those examples I gave, the judges were, were actually very aware of the politics of what they were doing. Um, they weren't immune from them at all. And those of you, I mean, there's a chapter or two in my book about this, and those who've read other stuff I've written will know that I'm, I'm not for the depoliticization of justice at all. Um, I'm, I'm for acknowledging that it's, it's political, and then trying to tame it and master it, and above all, getting it to go in the political direction that I want. <laughs> um, but I don't think that we, we uh, advance this process by, 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 by perpetuating the fiction that this is some sort of neutral, apolitical uh, business. It's not. It's never, it, you know, as long as you have a court that has jurisdiction over a big chunk of the planet and that can only do one case every year or two, there's going to be political decisions about what it's about what it's up to, and um, you know the, the people in the, the whole all the people in the system have to be, you know, they have specific roles to play in, in that process, but they have to be conscious of that, and then they have to do it as as well and as responsibly as they can, rather than pretend that that's not about all. Time for maybe a quick question, anybody? No. And I want to ask about scavenging in the water famous Paris. Charles? 
But that's the protocol one, yeah, the finding protocol one in the uh, Flavius batch, which they did. Okay, and I just say thanks to Louise and to Jim.